There we go. go. All right. I wanted to bring into the room some of uh, what already is here, uh, and that has to do with the very rich discussion that we were having earlier this morning. But I thought that I would start with a few cases just to make sure that we um, had a common uh, uh, um, referent uh, uh, in our discussion. So let me, let me read you this one. This is a 62-year-old Spanish-speaking woman who is newly insured under the ACA. And because she's newly insured, she goes to a place which is not used to dealing with a lot of uh, immigrant uh, patients. And it's a university medical center where, uh, and she's now having her appointment after her recent heart attack. Her young, earnest, wonderful physician, using a phone interpreter, begins to tell her about the merits and drawbacks of combined uh, anticoagulation with uh, clopidogrel and aspirin, stressing the higher percentage bleed with combination therapy over single aging treatment. On the other hand, the better protection conferred by the combination therapy, and in fact, the low chance in absolute numbers of a major bleed. After four minutes, he finishes and by asking her which drug she wishes to take. Thoroughly confused, the patient looks at him and says, see, here's another case. The oncology team is rounding and is happy to catch the elderly Cantonese uh, speaking man alone. He has had family continuously at his bedside, but the team needs to inform him of the pathology results showing lymphoma and obtain his consent to initiate chemotherapy. They pull up a speakerphone and call for a professional interpreter. Impatient with the arrangement, the MD dives right in. I'm so glad we can talk with you now. We need to tell you about your cancer and have you decide on the treatment. The patient turns away and barely responds. Here's another case. Please give the baby one teaspoon of the antibiotic three times a day for seven days. Give it to her even if the fever is gone, explains the well-meaning pediatrician. Dele al bebé una cucharita de antibióticos tres veces al día por siete días, aunque ya no tenga fiebre. The interpreter correctly interprets. There's only one problem. What is a cucharita? We don't know. Here's another case, the physician. You can also enter hospice and they will help your family take care of you. The interpreter. Puede entrar al hospicio y ellos ayudarán a su familia a cuidarlo. Hospice is a program for terminally ill patients focused on the palliation of symptoms. Hospicio is a home that you enter when you have been discarded. It's a home for abandoned children or the poor elderly. These cases, and there could be so many others, are not egregious cases. This is bread and butter clinical medicine in an extraordinarily and increasingly complex clinical panorama of care. And they illustrate just one tip of the iceberg of how difficult it is for patients and clinicians to overcome the language, literacy, and cultural barriers toward effective, equitable, patient-centered, valuable care. Let's start with why, just to repeat the obvious. If you use a strict definition of LEP, that people who report speaking English not well or not at all, there are about 14 million people, of which 11 million speak Spanish. 70% of the LEP in the United States have less than high school education. Not high school, but less than high school education. 6.6 .6 of these 11 million, uh, sorry, of the 14 million, are under the federal poverty line. As has already been discussed, less acculturated to US health practices, which not only include practices around informed consent and dialogue, but also include a real true diversity of views on how a patient and a family should make decisions, something that I'm hinting at in that second case around uh, the uh, 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 elderly man 
with a uh, uh, Chinese man with lymphoma. You know that LEP patients report more medication error, uh, less understanding of prescription labels, less likely to know medication. You know that language barriers have been implicated in patient safety. And you know, and here comes the business case for Dr. Wolf, that language barriers are associated with worse outcomes in diabetes care. Uh, 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 however, there is in the few other studies that have examined this in, um, in other um, areas have found no association between language uh, uh, barriers and outcomes of care, particularly when using uh, for, particularly for diseases where care is heavily routinized, such as uh, uh, MI care, uh, my, uh, myocardial infarction care. Nonetheless, there is widespread agreement that things are not working. We did a national survey of interpreters um, uh, around end of life discussion, and only half of them reported that those discussions usually went at all well. 80% of them wanted more training in end of life interpreting, and 80% of them feel actually the doctors need more training in working with interpreters, with interpreters, not so much around, uh, we weren't asking them about do they need more training in end of life care, that is also true, but here specifically around how to work with interpreters. Dr. Andrulis talked about the need for comparative effectiveness research in this, era, in this field, and I couldn't agree with him more. To my knowledge, there has been no study comparing by, uh, in, in a randomized prospectus fashion uh, care provided by a language concordant uh, physician and care provided via an interpreter. The closest study we have is this one, a natural experiment conducted at Bellevue. The NYU investigators were interested in knowing whether in state-of-the-art interpreter system A was better than state-of-the-art interpreter system B. Physici patients who came into the ER all, um, were uh, assigned, randomly assigned to A versus B unless it happened that the physician on duty who was assigned to take care of them spoke their language. At the end of the visit, patients were um, questioned as to how well they understood the physician's explanation and if they felt they understood the instructions. What I want you to notice here is that there are very little differences between A and B, both of them under 40% understanding the explanations and instructions. Language concordant patients understood, patients seen by a language concordant physician understood much more. And yet even there, only 60% felt they understood the instructions of how they should move forward. We have a long way to go in overcoming these barriers for our patients. So what are the common challenges? Well, we've hinted at them and I wanna make them explicit. Uh, determining the health literacy level of a patient can be very challenging, particularly when you don't take a social history and you don't know whether the person sitting in front of you belongs to that 70% of the LEP who have less than a high school education, or in fact, is the engineer from China now here and, uh, uh, and, 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 can, and knows uh, more math than you do and can uh, elderly, uh, el elderly person who can really um, understand uh, the percentages of risk that you wish to describe. This means that information sharing can so easily be too much, too little, or simply too wrong not in fact what the patient wants to know, which may be how soon can I go back to work. Equitable care can be equated, particularly by inexperienced physicians, but by everyone, as same care, and the need to offer similar information to all patients. For example, we should do genetic counseling with our patients and offer them the same information. We need to offer our patients clopidogrel plus aspirin or clopidogrel alone or aspirin alone. You decide. On the other hand, when we don't do that, we can easily fall into the trap of substituted judgment or paternalism, which can rob patients of agency and autonomy. And we've all seen that. What many people have talked about is that the, 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 consum the, the, the consumerist model that some people fall into with shared decision, in a false view of shared decision making, can easily leave patients feeling uh, confused 
and alone and deprived of professional services uh, rather than guided. And finally, and as someone else alluded to this, uh, as Dr. Rudd alluded to this earlier, the cultural value of individualism is seen as universal. Of course, I need to go in and talk to the patient. He's alone now. The current standard of care calls for the use of professional interpreter, and we have no data as to whether this is uh, how often hospitalized patients are actually spoken with via an interpreter. There are no national data around this point. We do know that physician training in working with interpreters is neither mandated nor tested. My own institution, UCSF, has not had a leader in, in many ways in providing uh, equitable, uh, in providing outstanding training for our medical schools, um, has not had mandatory class in interpreter uh, training until this year. Why is that? Well, it was one of the things one picked up on the wards, just like one picked up what a purple top is. Few systems are starting to test and certify bilingual physicians, a very important uh, route if we want physicians to actually speak directly with their patients and, uh, uh, and, um, and, and, and be able to, to uh, correctly not use interpreters. Underuse of interpreters and use of inappropriate interpreters are rampant. And, it's, uh, and as we start talking about ways in which we may need to tweak interpreter training, change interpreter roles, we have to remember, as was said earlier, that one of the biggest barriers is that no one's getting the interpreter at all. Interpreter training is one that values the role of language conduit rather than what of culture advocate. And I think that uh, uh, Wilma uh, Alvarado spoke to that uh, beautifully, um, saying that is our role. Correct. Should it be? What are the dangers if it's not? Should the interpreter speak up and say, the patient doesn't, un I'm the one who actually understands what each one of you is saying, and I can tell you, you're not understanding each other. There are many uh, dangers inherent in that. And then there's a lack of systems to facilitate meetings with the medical team at all. I was very surprised my father was hospitalized in my home country in Argentina two years ago. And he was in the ICU, first the CCU and then the ICU. And I said, I want to talk with the doctors. They said, yeah, come, come, come at the doctor time. I'm like, what do you mean? Come at the doctor time. And it turns out that every day there's two doctor times. There's a meeting at 11, 11 to 12, and a meeting 7 to 8. And the family shows up and they call, you, they call out the patient's name. And family group after family group goes up and speaks with the doctor. So you know what time you can speak with the doctor. There is a time after work where you can come and speak with the doctor. You can bring other family members and my friend who's a doctor to come and help me speak with the doctor. And yet these sim simple solutions, um, and, they're not, and nothing in healthcare is simple, are not integrated uh, within, US within the US healthcare system. And because of all of that, we have, um, um, we have uh, multiple studies uh, like this one of ours using data from, uh, North, uh, from Northern California Kaiser showing that LEP patients who see language, uh, let's see, um, that LEP patients appear to trust physicians equally, but that's because language concordant physicians are so much more likely to trust uh, their patients than uh, than LEP patients who are cared for by a language discordant physician. Patients who are cared for by a language discordant physician in a system that uses interpreters and certified bilingual staff and quite, uh, a quite, an excellent, quite excellent system are much more likely to feel treated poorly because of language or that the physician is not showing respect. All of our patients feel that the doctor doesn't listen. Um, that didn't vary by language. Um, so again, the, what is the stand, when I've shown you the data on how uh, poor the, uh, the understanding is via interpreters, you can say, well, what are you saying here? There's nothing that we can do. 
that, that these systems come together? No, bilingual physicians are partly a solution. And there we see this and we've documented better uh, glycemic control, for example, in patients cared for by bilingual physicians, though in some other outcomes such as lipid control or MI treatment, that has not been the case. So what can be done? One is to structure systems to require professional interpreters for LEB patients. I would like to see um, that uh, we set a floor. This is not something that's difficult for all of us in this room to get behind. Every hospitalized patient should have one, converse, at least one conversation a day um, with the treating clinician. And that, that conversation should be mediated by an interpreter if they don't speak the same language. That can be integrated easily into the medical record. This is not rocket science. This does not require, fundam this does not require single payer. This does not require um, a, a, a full reassessment of the U.S. healthcare system. This is, an, this is an easy floor. We obviously need to do a much better job training interpreters and training physicians in communications, but we also need to do a better job training all clinicians, not just uh, physicians. And uh, we spoke earlier about the requirements that need to actually be enforced around, um, tr around written uh, material. Finally, we need to diversify the workforce. At the end of the day, it is easier to, um, to, uh, to ask people appropriate questions uh, when they know from their own experiences and that of their family members how difficult it is uh, uh, to be a patient in poverty. And the health system is somewhat responding, and I think we'll talk more about this today. Facilitating language matches, um, differential pay for language skills in some systems, such as the Kaiser Permanente here in Southern California. There is some investment in interpreter technology, but again, interpreter technology is only good if you remember that the patient may still have low literacy, as, as, and most likely does, as, uh, as, as, as the numbers show us. And then all sorts of experiments, team lists, modules, group visits, health coaches, navigators, promotoras. Those all need to become to scale. They need to be incorporated into the medical record. They need, uh, obviously, to be paid for. It is my view that, unfortunately, there is only return on investment on providing equitable care, um, but that there, is many, there are many things in medicine that I do every day for which I am not asked to justify the business case. And I, I think that um, for this, this to me is, uh, uh, there will be a return on investment in terms of a healthier community. But for now, um, we need to hold the line around patient-centeredness, safety, equity, and, uh, and simply doing things. So there will be a future with, uh, uh, I think, where, where we will um, be able to um, have better hospitals, but at the end of the day, this will, this will take uh, a great deal of time. Let me, let me stop there. I don't want to trail off, but, um, but simply say um, that, um, that for those of us who work, uh, as, I, as I have the privilege of doing at San Francisco General Hospital, um, culture, language, and literacy are inexorably entwined. Um, but as our patients move to other systems, or as uh, we try to get them care beyond the level of primary care, this is an extraordinarily difficult uh, task uh, to do well. And I think that uh, I look forward to the discussions because I actually think that there are low-hanging policy fruits that we can um, easily um, uh, speak to. Thank you.